have the uh, candidates introduce themselves. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, my name is Derek Brown, I appreciate that. Do we each have two minutes to do an intro introduction? Okay, does that, that work? Thank you for coming here, thank you. Um, I as well have always made it a pra practice of doing whatever Suzanne asks. So this is what we all know that, so thank you so much. And thank you to my best uh, Utah Republican woman, Emily, who is here today and very supportive. Thank you. Uh, many years ago, when I was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Senator Mike Lee, one of the things we had in the office was a large cabinet as you walked in. I don't know how many of you have been in that office in D.C., but when you walk in the front, there's this cabinet, it's about this wide and this tall. On the top of the cabinet, we had every bill passed by Congress the previous year. Inside the cabinet, we had every regulation passed in the same year by the Obama administration. The number of bills passed by Congress were about 600 pages. Inside the cabinet, about 60,000 pages. If you stood then end to end, which we did one time just for fun, it was about 11 feet tall. So for every new page of congressional laws, there's roughly 100 pages of unelected, mid-level government bureaucrats who are telling us what to do. And this is one of the biggest problems we have here in the state of Utah, is we have unelected bureaucrats who are stepping on our rights, whether it comes to education, energy, environment, the lands, whatever that issue is, and I believe that Utah needs to push back. A number of years ago, there was a Supreme Court decision. Justice Roberts, who's not necessarily my favorite Supreme Court justice, was the one who wrote the opinion. And at the end, he said, and I, and I quote, he said, states are separate and independent sovereigns. Sometimes they need to act like it. My job as Attorney General, if I'm elected, is to make sure that Utah is not just a separate and independent sovereign, but that it acts like it. Thank you. I appreciate you being here today. Utah County, you always show up. I was here at a delegate event on Saturday, and there were hundreds of people. You always show up. Thank you for being engaged in the process. My husband and I are so happy to be here with you today. I'm Rachel Terry, and I'm running for Attorney General. I've been a practicing attorney for 20 years, and seven of those I spent at the Attorney General's office handling some of the most significant cases in our state's history. Things like, I represented the University of Utah in the Lauren McCluskey case, represented the Space Dynamics Lab in Logan on a billion dollar trade secret case. Now I'm the director of a state agency with a $200 million budget whose sole purpose is to protect Utah and Utah's assets. Every day, I get to work with the governor's office, the legislature, university, school districts, and all the stakeholders across the state to create policies, legislation, and programs that will make the state better and safer. The reason I'm in this race today is because I love the work. I do it every day. I love the people who are doing the work, who are carrying the heavy water, who are prosecuting child pornography, who are defending cases that are difficult. Those are the people I love, and more importantly, I love the people that we're doing that work for. I know how to fight and win, I've never lost a case, and I will fight for Utah every single day and I will focus on the work and nothing else. Thank you again, I'm Rachel Terry. Suzanne, thank you. Utah County Republican Women, thank you. Thank you for being here. My name is Trent Christensen. I'm an America First candidate for Attorney General and I'm going to drain the Salt Lake Swamp. That's what I want to do on my first day in life. Thank you. Let me tell you what I think that means. Last September, I'll tell you the reason I got into this race. Last September, there was an article that ran, KSL. It said that there was a legislator that proposed the idea of taking the Attorney General's office and making it an appointed position under the governor. Pause for a minute. That's why I got into this race. This office, of every office that we have in government, is the single most powerful office that U.S. citizens have against the other powers and branches and officers of government. This office. The legislature can check the governor, the governor can check the legislature, but it takes time. 
who can do it immediately on day one, an attorney general. And I compliment my fellow candidates for being here because this is a job where you have to stand up and throw a punch when you have to stand up and throw a punch. And you have to be willing to do that. Can I do that? Well, let me tell you my experience. After I graduated BYU, Magna Cum Laude, I went back east. I did complex business litigation. I did it for a number of years. I practiced protecting companies against the federal government. I filed briefs with appellate courts. I filed briefs with the Supreme Court. Came back to Utah, and then I took a turn. I went to the private sector. I've been a CEO of my own company. I've hired and fired and made payroll for three years, and now I'm general counsel for a tech firm. We do military contracts. We do, sorry, AI contracts with the military. Why is that important? Who knows how many, off how many people are in the Attorney General's office? Rachel does. Anybody else? 600 people in that office. 300 of them are attorneys. They're not always the easiest people to deal with. And if you can't come in with litigation experience, but also leadership experience, and take the helm and enshrine your vision, then that office is going to run you. I want to tell you a story about the first case I ever took to trial. The state had come and taken a couple's kids away, 9 and 11, at gunpoint. And I fought for eight months to get those kids back to their parents and fight to protect their parental rights. And that's the mindset that an attorney general needs to have. You need to fight the state, not fight for the state, and that's what I will do for you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Frank Myler, and um, I've been married for over 36 years, and I have five adult children. They've all graduated from college. Um, five um, grandchildren, but that's only from my uh, oldest, and uh, the other ones haven't started yet. Um, but I am, by God's grace, uh, glad to be able to say that all of my children and all their spouses are actually very, very conservative. Um, and that's hard to do these days. It is very hard. Can you hear me? Thank you. Great. And um, so that's, that's where my passion draws from. Um, it draws from the fact that um, <clears throat> I really care deeply about constitutional issues. And um, as I said, I, there's no question that I've been practicing a lot longer than anyone else here. Um, but it's also, you look at the kind of things I've done. Um, I'm the only one that has lots of jury trials. I literally have a jury trial next month in federal court. I have about as many jury trials as anyone in Salt Lake. Um, but what's more important, I've also argued many times before the Utah Supreme Court, many times before the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, but what's more, even more important to me than that, in a, a 20, um, about 2020 or before, I went into private practice. And um, I started my own law firm where I manage attorneys. I manage attorneys in the AG's office too. But when I, sorry, I thought it was too loud. Um, I started also working with the Alliance Defending Freedom. Has anyone heard of that organization? It is one of the most fantastic organizations that was designed to start fighting against the ACLU. I'm what they call an honor guard attorney with that organization. Um, Mike Ferris, who started a homeschool legal defense association and was the CEO and, and in charge of Alliance Defending Freedom, he's written this endorsement letter of me. It's in the back. You can have it. But I've defended pro-life sidewalk counselors. I've defended religious freedom. I've defended parental rights. Not only defended them, but I took it into a Section 1983 case, and I won three times substantial settlements in the, in the federal courts here at Utah. And so this is the difference. I have actual in the trenches experience of fighting for these rights and not charging the clients even when I'm doing so. That's why you can know that I'm going to continue to do these kinds of things. Because everyone is going to say, thank you, I guess I'm out of time. <laughs> what is your day one plan for uh, the office? There are two things that I'm going to do on day one, in form and in substance. The Attorney General is an elected position, but currently the office does not have constituent services to engage with people. If you call the office, you'll probably get shuffled around to a bunch of secretaries and you'll give up. So number one, we make sure there's a way for you to tell me how we're doing and what needs you have and connect you to legal services. Secondly, the most critical, time-sensitive issue that's happening is public lands. I was just talking to an individual in Garfield County a few minutes ago who is about to lose his livelihood, as will the entire county, those who are farmers and our ranchers, because of decisions being made by bureaucrats. And he told me, I don't have time for fake promises, and I don't have time for you to promise to not do anything because I'm losing my livelihood now. There are these cute teenage girls who will not be able to to ranch any further. They should have been six generation ranchers. That is a top priority because it is happening right now 
it's time sensitive, so those are the two issues I'll do day one. Election integrity, that is my day one issue. On day one in office, I won't call for an investigation. No. On day one, I will begin an investigation, a full statewide transparent audit of Utah's electoral system. Now, I've said that a number of times at a number of different events. I said it on Saturday to many of you. And people have said to me, well, Trent, doesn't the lieutenant governor run elections? And the answer to that is yes. But the state attorney general, and I'll say this again, is the most important check against the power of the other branches of government that you have and has the full constitutional authority to run that audit or any investigation of any regulatory agency in this state. So what does that mean? That means I want to see the ballots. I want to see the mail-in ballots. I want to see the machines. I want to talk to the county clerks. I want to talk to their staffs. I want to know everything that's happening in elections so that you, the people, know if it's working. Listen, if we run an audit and everything's great, great then you know. If we run an audit and there's some things that need to be fixed, then we know. But you have to run the audit. I've never been part of an organization that didn't voluntarily audit its books and then report those findings to the people that needed to know. And the government needs to do the same, and I will do that on day one. I don't disagree with anything that was just said, but one of the things that's also going to be done on my first day is going to, I'm going to fight this sanctuary state nonsense that the federal government is putting on us. And it's also been put on us by Salt Lake City. And when I get together with the legislature, we're going to have a plan and we're going to derail that completely and not allow these flights to come in in the middle of the night with people from New York that are illegal aliens. Again, the, re uh, the, the whole federal land thing, I just got a call from a, someone in Garfield County. This is a huge issue. It was a big issue when I ran in 2000, and because of it, I encouraged Mark Shirtliff when he won to actually file a lawsuit against the feds. I'm going to file lawsuits, but I'm also going to strategically make sure we can win them because I actually have that kind of experience of filing, filing these sorts of suits. And so that's what you have to put your trust in. Who's done this sort of thing before? Everyone's going to say, oh, I'm going to do this. But what kinds of things have you actually done to fight for rights? Thank you. There's a very important decision that is going to be coming down from the Supreme Court, hopefully within the next couple of months, dealing with what we call the Chevron Doctrine. This completely changes the balance of power between agencies and Utah. For me, day one, will be looking for, and I will be ready on day one. I'm not going to start on day one. I will be ready by day one to work on lawsuits specifically addressing issues involving federal lands, which I've worked on at length when I was Senator Lee's Deputy Chief of Staff. I worked on it in the legislature. Education, environment, what's going on right now in the border in Texas. I think Utah needs to work with other attorneys general. I know many of them. We will work with them to file lawsuits and be ready to go because Utah, as I said, needs to push back. We need to act like the separate and independent sovereign that we are. And the attorney general is the one person in the state with the authority to do that very thing. So that's what I will begin on day one. Thank you. I understand, uh, as we have just heard, there are 600 people in the uh, uh, Attorney General Agency in this state. What is your experience uh, in managing a large number of people? Thank you for that question. It's not just 600 people. That includes 300 attorneys, and that has to be said. And I'll say it again, 300 attorneys. Attorneys aren't the easiest people to deal with, right? And so to be able to take your vision and implement it and steer that off is going to be very important. So here's my experience in leading a company, okay? I ran a venture accelerator. We helped 80 to 90 entrepreneurs every single year uh, get their pitch decks ready, present to, entre excuse me, excuse me, present to investors, and then raise money. Uh, Ancestry.com, Myriad Genetics, uh, uh, other pharmaceutical companies have all gone through our company. Okay, but you have to learn to make a culture. You have to build a culture. There are people in the Attorney General's office that could be practicing at any firm anywhere across the country because they're really good at what they do. So they need to have a purpose. And they need to know that the Attorney General has their backs. We are going to go and we're going to fight. And that's what they need to understand. And if you do that, then you'll have people on your side. You'll be able to go and fight the federal lands. You'll be able to go and fight the sanctuary states because they'll know that the Attorney General has their back. If you 
create that culture, you're going to have better retention in the office. You're going to get better attorneys coming in. And that's what I will start with on day one is building that culture. Thanks. I've actually had experience <clears throat> managing attorneys inside the office, but also outside of the attorney general's office. That's hugely important because um, I also have an MBA and I read a, I got about a guy named Peter Drucker who talked about management by wandering around. One of the things I'm going to do is something that no attorney general has really done, and I work with three of them. I'm going to go around to every aspect of the office, know what they're doing, how I can help them do their job better. It's actually human resources and really trying to motivate those attorneys to do a good job is a huge part of management. Um, I'm the only one with that kind of expertise. Also, my, my, my expertise in terms of jury trials, appellate cases, criminal work. Um, I had my first uh, criminal felony case when I was two years out of law school. That is the stuff that they, you need to have so they respect that you know what in the world you're talking about. If you haven't done those sorts of in the trenches legal practice, you're not going to have the respect of those attorneys. Thank you. There are three things, I appreciate this question because there are three things that I believe this position needs. Number one, obviously, is the legal background and legal knowledge to engage in these really difficult, complex issues. Number two, a, a knowledge of both state and federal law and agencies and how they interact. But then it is a leadership role. I've ran a business with employees. I understand the private sector side of things. I ran Senator Lee's offices here in the state of Utah, all the employees dealing with all the county commissioners. And as party chair, I ran a party with 760,000 members. And I basically built it from the ground up because the day I got there, we had no funding, we had no office, we had nothing like that. And we worked with county officials, including probably the most important issue I dealt with was elections. This is what I dealt with on a daily basis, is making certain that our elections here in Utah were safe and secure. And so my, my, my experience managing other people is exactly what you need in someone who's the Attorney General, because as has been mentioned, there are over 500 people in that office. My goal is to get to know every one of them. I'm doing that work right now. As I mentioned, I'm managing a state agency with a $200 million budget. Part of my work is working with the Attorney General's office every single day. Those people know that I will be with them in the trenches because I'm in the trenches with them right now, today. We're talking about legal strategy. I have meetings Wednesday morning. We're talking about legal strategy. We're talking about the attorneys. We're talking to, about resources for attorneys. So I won't need any time to get up to speed on how to manage that office because I'm doing it now. And the litigation division is accountable to me in the work that they're doing. And they trust me and I trust them. These are incredible attorneys. There are definitely tweaks that need to be made, but I am committed to the work and will be in the weeds with them all day, every day for you. When you represent, uh, when you are the representative of the people versus uh, the uh, lawyer for the state agencies. What if your agency, uh, Department of Health or Department of Commerce, doesn't want you to uh, sue the federal government, but you think a suit uh, for the federal government uh, is the best representative of the people, to represent the people of the Utah, what would you do? That's a great question. First of all, the citizens are my client. Yes, the agencies are your client. I have actual experience in having to tell agencies sometimes, no, you can't do this, or no, you should not do this. Um, I actually, one was with the Department of Health because I was legal counsel as well as special assistant AG over the Department of Health, and I had to tell them they were violating federal law by supporting um, gay pride parades when it said in the statutes that they were not allowed to promote 
promote homosexuality with the funds that we were being used. That I stood up to them saying, you can't do this. I will follow the rule of law. That's what you can trust. And I actually stood up to the Department of Corrections also when there was corruption involved. In both instances, potentially risking my job. Sometimes you have to stand against the agency and say, no, this is not right. You cannot do this. But I will try to work with them to the best I can um, and, and not try to cause some sort of a conflict, but sometimes you do have to depart from what those agencies want to do. Thank you. This is one of the reasons. This is one, oh, is this mic also up? No, I'm going to push this down, that way you don't, uh, you don't get me twice or an echo. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I strongly oppose having this position be an appointed position. Is There is a level of, of transparency and there's a level of, of independence that the Attorney General currently has. It's under our Constitution. It's designed that way. And so when you have that level of independence, you can work with these agencies, as you should. That's what we do as in this role. You work with the agencies. But you're accountable to who? To the people who elected you in the office in the first place. And so you need to have the fortitude to stand up. You need to have the ability and the knowledge to say no. And ultimately, you're accountable not just to the people but as an attorney, to the rule of law. And so that's why I oppose this being an appointed position. I, I believe that the way it's structured is deliberate and it is correct, and I will support it that way and have the wherewithal to stand up on those occasions because you know there will be those occasions when that happens because it happens all the time. Thank you. This is another area where I can tell you that I'll do it because I'm doing it now. There are a lot of agencies who want to take different steps, who want to implement certain programs, and I get to tell them no. I get to tell them yes, because we are working on these together. In my current role, I help evaluate what the Department of Corrections are doing. What's K what is K-12 through doing? What are universities doing? Are they following the law? Are they creating risk? Are they representing the state of Utah the way they should be. And when they're not, I get to call them out. I get to help them lead, I get to help them course correct, and I do that in a way that I get buy-in, because that matters too. It's not just fighting with the stakeholders, but getting them to trust you, and you trust them, and you work with them, and it's something I'm committed to doing, because, and you know I am, because I'm doing it every single day. This is a hypothetical question. Let me give you some specific answers. In 2020, when the Utah legislature gave special power to the health boards, who then tried to pass mask mandates and vaccine mandates, they would have met with an attorney general that said, no, we're not going to do that because it's unconstitutional. When parents, when parents show up to school board meetings and get arrested because they want to have a voice in this state, I would stand up for those parents and say to the school boards, no, we have an advocate for attorney general. And when the county sheriffs come to me and they say, we need to know you have our back because we actually want to enforce the illegal immigration laws, but we need to know the attorney general is going to have our back. They need to know that I'm going to stand arm in arm with them. We are going to enforce the illegal immigration, the immigration laws in this country. We're going to protect our citizens from the fentanyl, from the sex trafficking, from the drug trafficking, from the crime trafficking. And they're going to have an attorney general that has their back at all times. <laughs> Well, these candidates are answering my questions already. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to ask them anyway. We'll, we'll have some short answers. Uh, should the Attorney General Office be elected or appointed? <laughs> As a matter of fact, we've discussed that. I, I'm just curious, raise your hands. How many think it should be an appointed position? Okay, I don't see any. Okay, so for that to happen, a majority of people would have to vote to change the Constitution. So it's a hypothetical, it's not going to happen. And I think the way it is designed right now, our system is designed, is the way it should be. Because ultimately, the Attorney General is accountable to you. That's the way the system should be. That gives the Attorney General the ability to stand up, the ability to do what's right, and know that because the person, if you are appointed to that position by the person, who are you accountable to? To that person, exactly. So that's why I believe that the way the system is structured in Utah is the way it should be. It's the best system, and absent the Constitution changing anytime soon, which judging on 
assuming that, that what I see here is a representative sample of Utahns generally, which I believe it is, I don't think that's going to be happening. Simple answer, no, absolutely not. Slightly longer answer is, not only should it not be appointed, there should also be some space between the governor, the legislature, and the attorney general. Because the attorney general is supposed to be the one who is enforcing the rule of law. The attorney general is the one who is accountable to make sure that everyone is staying in their life. Thank you. Here's the problem with this scenario. It's not hypothetical. It was proposed last October. And if it was proposed, that means somebody thinks it's a good idea. And in the article I read, the governor thought it was a good idea, too, and said he just wanted to learn more about it, okay? So it's not coming up this session. Will it come up again? I don't know, because I haven't spoken with the person that proposed it the first time. But here's the thing. You know, as well as I do, it's going to keep coming up, because it's not the only instance. There's currently a movement to get the Utah State Board of Education appointed under the governor. There's a consolidation of power that's attempting to happen right now in the swamp in Salt Lake, which is why we have to drain it. I'll say it again, drain the Salt Lake swamp. So I agree with what's been said, obviously, thank you. Obviously it needs to be independent, but it needs to stay there. So stay vigilant and elect someone who knows where the fight is coming from and can take the fight to those people and say, not only are we gonna stay independent, but you're gonna see a couple of th uh, punches thrown if you try to go that direction again. I agree with everything that Trent just said, and I will just say this, it needs to be a check. It's a check for the people in terms of constitutionality. But I also am really troubled because actually the governor did try to appoint somebody. He, he decided who was going to be the attorney general already, and he's already endorsed him. And, um, yet, um, and yet he did, the governor had no idea who was even running at that time. I think that's irres irresponsible actually for anyone to do that. As your attorney general, I'm, I'll work with the governor. I'm not going to be antagonistic to him. But if he violates and goes contrary to the Constitution, I have no problem because he hasn't endorsed me. He's not giving me anything. He's fighting against me right now and all the three of us. He's fighting against the three of us here. You need to know that. Thank you. Uh, we'll give uh, Derek a moment to uh, 30 seconds to respond. I appreciate that, and, 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 and because I guess that that attack was was, was directed at me. I, I have worked with the governor, and I appreciate the support of people like Senator Mike Lee, who endorsed me, and the governor is someone who supported me. I've worked with them. I've also disagreed with the governor. You need someone who knows how to do that on a powerful way. When I was party chair, he and I had many disagreements, and those disagreements were sometimes very heated. But you need an attorney general who is able to have those disagreements and still stand up. There's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, he's not trying to point anyone because ultimately it gets decided by you, doesn't it? Uh, the federal government has increased its overreach uh, at an accelerating pace in the last few years. What can be done to reverse this trend and restore a proper constitutional balance between the states and the federal government? Well, we would all hope that Congress would restore that proper balance, but it's not happening. And so the way this is being addressed is through conservative Republican attorneys general across the country banding together to fight for state sovereignty uh, one individual who's been doing that for, for the nation is Attorney General Ken Paxton in Texas, who is fighting every single day. He is someone who's endorsed me in this race because he knows how important, uh, we share how important the state's sovereignty is. And I'll share one last thing. It's not states' rights. We have individual rights. It's state's sovereignty. And we have to fight for it every day, and the way it's happening is in the courtroom. And it's been happening somewhat for Utah, but it's gotta be more and more and more until the federal government is back in its place. I grew up along the Wasatch Front, 
And this has been eye-opening to me as I go around the state and talk to people. There are currently 60 pending cases right now in federal courts where the state is suing the federal government specifically over public lands, over grazing rights. If we lose those grazing rights, that's a huge chunk of out of our state GDP, over access to public lands, right? Over the dirt, they call it dirt tourism down there, Moab and, and, the, and the trails and the, and the Zion's Park and whatnot. If we lose those, you know, those bring in more revenue to the state than skiing. That is a huge part of our revenue, but sometimes the Attorney General's office will send the B and the C team. Right now there's a lawsuit in Uinta County where over the, the, the Ute Indian tribe is claiming original jurisdiction over the water. If they win, that changes everything along the Wasatch Front. But who are we sending out there? That has to be a focus, a primary focus, and it doesn't matter if it's only if it's not happening along the Wasatch Front. It has to be the focus of an attorney general who knows what the priorities in, in the states are. It's about relationships, relationships with county sheriffs, with county commissioners, right? It's about relationships with the federal government so we can be proactive in stopping them in the future, not just fighting them when they come, but putting a stop to them before they come, and that's what I'll do as attorney general. Yes, I think there's a lot of strategy that you can come up with, and we need to start taking it back step by step. Um, I just got a call from someone in Gulf, Garfield County on the way down here, and he said that he hasn't been getting the help from our senators and congressional delegation in fighting them. But I'll tell you who has been fighting the most, more than any other elected officials, it's our sheriffs. It's our rural county sheriffs. Almost all of them are endorsing me for a reason. I am, I am familiar with working with them. I've defended every sheriff in the state except Salt Lake County, and I will fight with them on these issues just like I did back in 2000. When I ran in 2000, they asked me to come down there and help them with some of the cattle and grazing problems that they were having. Again, I did not charge them a dime for that. This is a real issue that is not going away. We have to take back lost ground in this area or we're going to lose more and more rights. Right now, law enforcement is being kicked off of federal lands from being able to enforce the law on federal lands. Well, let me tell you, if someone gets raped on a federal lands, how quickly do you think a federal officer is going to come out there and investigate it and prosecute that? Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, this is probably the single biggest issue that we need to deal with as a state. This is why I told you about the cabinet in Mike Lee's office, because unelected, mid-level government bureaucrats are the ones causing all these problems, and we need to push back. It's critical that as a state, we step up and we take this role. This is something I've been working on, not just in Senator Lee's office. I was part of the first group of legislators that authorized lawsuits specifically against the federal government on issues like this, because the reality is, this could be solved by Congress doing their job, but I think we all know, based on what we're seeing, this is not going to be solved in the halls of Congress. These issues are going to be resolved in courtrooms, and that's why you need an attorney general who is active, who understands these issues, and who knows that the courtroom and working with other attorneys general around the country is the answer to solving these problems. We, as a state, have to push back. That's the way that we're going to do it. The EHE serves uh, not only the, the people of Utah, but also has a potential, a potential uh, for significant influence on the national scene. I will have questions about ESG, the border, Utah public lands, big tech, and gender issues, all of these of uh, which uh, the AG, AG Reyes has addressed. Please evaluate his initiatives and tell us whether you agree or disagree and what you would do, starting with ESG, an attack on the free market. Thank you. You may have to go through that list again. That was a long list. So for those of you who may not know, ESG, economic social governance, right? It's, it's a way for the banks and the investment firms to say to you, you want a loan, you qualify for it, but are you woke enough for it? That's what it is in a nutshell, okay? And Sean Reyes has done a good job. He set up a specific task force, and specifically what he did to partner with Marlow Oaks, our state treasurer, to fight against natural asset companies that wanted to come in and take our land. We're talking about the public, you know, the federal government taking our public lands. Now we're talking about China trying to come in and take our lands and buy it out from under us, right? So in terms of ESG, very happy with what Sean Reyes has done. Do you want me to address the other ones? Oh, we're just doing ESG. Um, here's why that's important, okay? Um, 
does anybody remember the name Colin Kaepernick? He played football, right? Do you know why Nike wanted to support him? It was because of ESG, and they saw it coming before the rest of us did. Nike wanted to get in front of it. That's why they lose money on shoes hand over fist, because they wanted to get in front of the banks, right? And now they're trying to push that down the throats of us, so that if you say, hey, or you're trying to buy a home in this state, which is also very hard, you're trying to get a loan, well, then let's look at your social credit score like you're from China. Do you have the right politics? Do you have the right pronouns? Do you have the right... Uh, social stances so that I can give you this loan. That has to stop, and I agree with what Sam, uh, Sean Ray has been doing about it. I agree 100% with that again. Um, I would also um, step up the issues on this because I think that we there is you, we need, you need to basically have a full court press on this. This is extremely serious. And um, you, you're, you, you see it a little bit in the NBA. Um, the, I, I mean, his, his name's escaping me now, but the basketball player that used to play for us that started speaking out against China and not wearing the shoes, you know, because of that. This is, this is a, you know, he, he paid a price, actually. You know, but we need to start standing up and paying a price. We need to start fighting this. There's no doubt about it that not just a lawsuit, but we need to look at every aspect. We need to look at regulations. We need to see where the federal government has overreached in what they're doing. And we need to also get some good laws passed by our legislature to prevent any more damage in this area. Thank you. Thank you. ESG, in a nutshell, is a political agenda being injected into the free market system where they know the free market system isn't going to work, right? The reason this is important is there's no industry that isn't affected by this. A few weeks ago, I met with the executive director of the NRA, and he talked to me about what is happening to come, I mean, I'm as big a Second Amendment supporter as there is, but I'm seeing these rights chipped away. Have you seen what just happened to the NRA in New York? Have you seen what happened to the Remington Gun Company that's been in New York forever and ever? There are these pressures that are not just political, but they're now being injected into the free market system, saying you can't engage in banking, you can't engage in retail, if you don't support the, the principles of, of you know, anti-Second Amendment policies. And so that's just one example. This is everywhere. And so we need to be vigilant, and I love the fact that state AGs around the country, like Tennessee recently filed an ESG lawsuit against BlackRock. Did you see that? For this very reason, and as AG, I will do the same thing. I was in the office working for Sean Reyes when he started working on these issues, in particular with uh, Marlo Oaks, and I support that work. We're only at the beginning. Only at the beginning. And I'll highlight the E of ESG, it's environmental. That is impacting our energy costs because the renewables are unreliables. The only reliable energy sources are coal and natural gas, which we have an abundance of in the state of Utah, but these policies are making electricity more expensive and less reliable. So we're just at the beginning of this fight and we will do this fight, we will engage in this fight every day because those industries, they're not just a part of our economic system. They're a part of what makes it affordable to be a family. We've had some of the least expensive energy costs and that's changing because of the E and the ESG and we will fight back. The border crisis, a major threat to national security, the flood of illegal immigrants, including terrorists, child sex trafficking, fentanyl. Do you agree that states like Utah and Texas have a constitutional right to defend themselves? What would you do? Well, as I said before, one of the things I'm going to do is get this, this sanctuary status taken away. That is a huge liability for us. But I'm also going to work with the sheriffs. I'm going to look for every, I'm going to document how this crime has increased fentanyl use and um, since, ever since the border crisis has gotten to the extreme that it has within the Biden administration. There are things that we can do here in Utah. Yes, there are also filing amicus briefs with Texas and other states, Arizona. Um, I'll absolutely be doing those kinds of things. But I want to do, I want to work with local law enforcement because that's where the, where the boots are on the ground, is the local law enforcement. And I have that experience in doing that already. I don't have to get up to speed because I already know the sheriffs and I know the county attorneys and I will work with them to try to fight this every step of the way. Here's the irony of this. 
Under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, we have limited enumerated powers for Congress. Congress can only do what it says it can do in that section. The states need to do everything else. Here's the irony. They're doing, federal government's doing everything they want to do, but in places like Texas, the one thing it's supposed to do, protect our borders, they're not doing. So I fully support what Governor Abbott has done in Texas. He's basically said, you have a right. Thank you. He said, you, you, as a, you should be protecting our borders, but if you're not doing that, then under Article One of the Constitution, we also have the right to protect our borders from invasion. And so this is the tug of war that is happening. When I talk about federalism and the federal government overreaching and the mid-level government bureaucrats, this is where you're seeing it. ICE and other areas, this is the front lines. And so I think it is critical that states push back. And the way they do it is through the state attorneys general. Frank's right, the, the sheriffs will tell you about what's happening. I've asked them, what are the biggest issues you're seeing? Fentanyl is one of them. And another is, in these small towns, there are a lot of people who are there illegally, and it's creating huge economic and social issues in those towns, um, and we have to give them the resources to deal with it. When uh, Attorney General Paxton was here a couple of weeks ago, as we sat down and talked about the issues, what is his number one issue? It's the border. And what he said is that um, he needs Utah to stand with them, because the federal government is suing Texas to stop Texas from protecting the border. Isn't this ridiculous? It's ridiculous. And I committed to him that I will stand with him in the state of Utah as your Attorney General. I mentioned earlier the Attorney General is the most important check against the power of government that you have. The question was, do we have a constitutional right? Yeah, it's the 10th. It says we have the right to do this and protect our borders. It says any power is not in the Constitution specifically given to the federal government, we have. So yeah, we have that right. But here's the, here's the problem. An attorney general can sue and, and enforce things horizontally, meaning he can sue the legislature, he can sue the governor, right? He can sue counties, he can sue the federal government. But the part of the problem isn't just the federal government. I think we need a governor who's going to stand up for our rights and not allow us to be a sanctuary state in the first place. And unless there's an attorney general that will say, no, we're not going to do that, you're not just fighting the federal government, you're fighting your own governor, and that's what needs to stop. And it will stop on day one. Look, if the, if the, if the legislature, if the governor, if they figure out, hold on a second, this guy is going to stop us, you only got to do it once, maybe twice, and then they'll figure out there's a new sheriff in town. That's what has to happen. We're going to get everybody on the same page. Utah, Utah public lands. If A.G. Reyes uh, filed for a lawsuit in the Supreme Court, as he said he would do, uh, before he leaves office, regarding the federal government control over 60% six, of Utah lands, would you continue that case or, would, or withdraw it? Thank you. Not only would I continue it, I would look for other areas where we can sue on this. When I was in the state legislature, we authorized the first of these lawsuits against this. And what we have right now is quite possibly the most conservative, constitutionally minded Supreme Court that we've ever had. And hopefully we get the White House this fall. If we don't, this may be the height of, of conservatism in the court. So what we need to do is we need to do this now. We need to file these suits. There are, as has been mentioned in the Office of Politico, they're working on 60 different lawsuits. I will look for other areas because you have uh, counties like Garfield, where it's 93% of the county land is controlled by the federal government. So to the answer to the question, will I continue it? Not only will I continue it, but I will work hand in glove with our federal delegation. I've spent time doing appellate law. I understand how these appeals work. And I'll make sure that as a state, we don't just continue to fight, but we'll lead the way because this is an issue. If you're a state west of the Mississippi, this is one of the most critical issues that we face for the future. The answer is yes. And it feels more personal than ever. There's a girl named Maisie who lives in Garfield County. She's supposed to be the seventh generation rancher in her family. But if these things don't stop, and they only have a little bit of time left, they will lose that ability. Maisie should get to have a ranch. 
And this is why I'm committed to this cause, and that is why I have the support of commissioners in Kane and Garfield and across the state, because they know that I will fight for their rights in our rural counties. The answer is yes. Not only would I continue it, I would argue it myself in front of the Supreme Court. That's how much I want this to go to the Supreme Court. I'm pretty good at that. Um, here's something else, though, and it's something that needs to be addressed right now. Um, I've heard throughout this campaign people say something to the effect of, hey, as Attorney General, I'm going to limit the federal go government overreach into the states. Okay? But you can't say that unless you fully back and endorse the only president in modern history who's actually limited federal involvement in the states, and that is Donald J. Trump. <laughs> President to pull back on public land to overreach. The only president to do that. If we have that ally in the White House, a lot of this goes away. Those 60 lawsuits I told you about, now we have an advocate and we get rid of those, right? And I don't have to waste uh, resources of the state and go argue those with myself at the Supreme Court. We need an ally in the White House. We've already heard Congress isn't going to do it for us, although we have good allies in Congress. We're not going to get into the judiciary. It just takes too long. We need Donald J. Trump as our president. I endorsed him on January 16th. I know other people in this race have, and I appreciate that, but that is my stance. I would absolutely uh, fight that suit and continue it, but I will want to correct something that nobody's picked up on. They said that the question was, file, he was going to file something in the Utah Supreme Court. Well, they will kick it down, because I've tried to do that with mandamus before, and our Utah Supreme Court will not hear it. So you'd actually have to file it in the district court and go through the old-fashioned way and then appeal it up. That's, again, something that just kind of went over the heads of everybody here. I've dealt with those kinds of issues. I've actually argued, not just filed brief, I've argued many times before the Utah Supreme Court, and I could argue this again just as well. But what I'm going to do is make sure we have some of the best people in the country helping us fight this. Because I've networked other attorneys, Alliance Defending Freedom, American Center for Law and Justice. I've worked with these kinds of attorneys, the, um, the national pro-life groups. I've brought them in sometimes to Utah to help them with some of our laws that we are passing. I will actually bring them in and not just rely on myself, but try to have the best expertise that we can to fight this fight. Yeah. Social media. What or should Utah do about big tech? Free speech, censorship versus censorship, unhealthy addictions, child abusers, Pornographers, traffickers, what would you do? I have 13 year old twins, and my daughter every week asks if she can get social media. And the answer remains the same no. There's no accident that the increase in mental health crises has tracked with the increase of social media use. The state of Utah has already passed bills and is fighting to uphold those bills and those laws for the state of Utah, because in Utah, we want to protect our children. And this is work that, <clears throat> excuse me, is also very personal. I prosecuted educator sexual misconduct. Every single one of those cases involved social media. It is an improper access to our children. Not only are kids seeing things they shouldn't see, like a level of perfection they can't achieve, but that is a gateway for predators to get to our children. And so, not only will I fight for those lawsuits, I will give more resources to the section in the Attorney General's office, because Internet Crimes Against Children, ICAC, that prosecutes child pornography, that goes after child predators online, because that has to stop. Our children must be protected. I agree with Rachel. Deeply, deeply personal question. I have four kids. My oldest is about to go on a mission. My oldest daughter's autistic. And I've been involved in um, a couple different groups to help kids with autism. They actually have a higher suicide rate, kids with autism. And it, it, it all starts, and again, I'll just echo what Rachel said, and I'm glad you said it, it comes always back to social media, okay? Now, in order to fight that fight, you have to be free, free of what's called conflicts of interest, right? You can't have been someone that helped the social media companies in the past, and now you want to fight the social media companies. You know, there was, uh, Facebook has received a lot of money from the Utah legislature, hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you were a lobbyist for Facebook, they were a recent client of yours, you have a conflict. You, you, I'm going to finish my time, Derek. Okay. Okay? Um, you can't fight them. You have a conflict. Okay? You can't fight for the social medias and then protect our kids. I come free.
history of conflicts, and I come with four very good reasons to fight this fight. I want to partner with those that have fought this fight in the past. Ken Ivory is one of them. I want to help all the school districts all across the state fight this, get this out of our schools. It's a very important issue, and I will fight it. Thank you. I've been fighting pornography for a long time. Um, I've actually had the litigation against the State Department of Corrections where I actually designed um, a lawsuit to prevent all nudity from any of the, in any of the prisons. And then I also brought that to the jails and fought that fight with the jails. I used a Title VII argument to say this was a hostile work environment for the women that had to work in those jails and prisons. We won that case. <laughs> I've also written widely, I've taught regarding anti-pornography issues. This is something that has been, again, things that I've been doing in the trenches. It's not speculation. I'm also going to keep fighting um, sexual slavery because regardless of what fell out with some of the stuff with Sean Reyes, that is an evil that is increasing in Utah and around the country. So I will continue to fight that every step of the way. When I was in the Department of Corrections, we worked with these things. We worked with ICAC, we worked with other groups to fight internet crimes. Um, I will step that up for sure if I'm Attorney General. Thank you. What I was referring to is the fact that a couple of years ago, the governor stood up and said, this is a problem. We need to address the problem. And he's right. And the companies, some of the biggest, like Meta, looked around Utah and said, who can help me solve this problem? Because we've got a big problem, and they understand it as well. They hired me. And my job was to bring the legislature together with the governor's office and understand in the AG's office and figure out how do we solve this issue, not just in light of our children, but in light of the Constitution. How do we do it constitutionally? How do we do it using the technology that is available to us? And I did that. We worked together. I understand these issues because I've been in the trenches. I've been working on that. I don't currently represent any of those companies. So there isn't a conflict, but I understand the issues more than anyone in this room because I've been living them. And that's why the legislators who have gone after social media companies are endorsing me in this race because they know I will work with them and we can solve this issue because I also have small children and this is a serious issue for our family as well. Okay, uh, gender issues. The growing controversy over gender, especially among young people, is illustrated by the recent passage and lawsuit against HB 11, banning uh, transgender athletes. What is your view on this issue? Should Utah allow transgender athletes to play on girls' t uh, teams? No. Um, to answer that question is no. Here's something else an attorney general can do. Um, who knows what a bully pulpit is? You heard that phrase? Bully pulpit means that you have the ability to stand up in public and people will listen to you. Okay? The only name more ubiquitous in this state than Spencer Cox is Sean Reyes. People know who that is. Okay? More than any other legislator or anybody. And you can stand up and have a voice on these issues. Because somebody should have, and I think we'll need to again in the future say, take the temperature down, okay? The answer to that question is no, but these are still kids. And the social media and the woke people and the ESG people have done a number on our kids. They're getting brainwashed in these schools, they're getting brainwashed on social media, and it's harmful, okay? But that doesn't mean you turn the temperature up. You take the temperature down and you do what's right for these kids. And that's what an attorney general can do, is say, you're right, Let's have a conversation, but bring the temperature down, because at the end of the day, we're still talking about kids. And that's what I would do as Attorney General. It's what I meant earlier about building a culture. We need a culture of solving problems in this state, and that's what I would do. I will definitely fight that with every fiber of my being, and I also will not play into their, their nonsense. Um, the fact is, a biological boy should not play sports or go into bathrooms of biological girls. That's why I'm going to reframe the narrative. I was, and again, actions are louder than words. I was uh, working with Alliance Defense Fund. We were actually going to bring a suit against one of the universities in Utah um, for tr the transports issues um, when COVID hit. It actually knocked out all the sports and we weren't able to do it. Um, but that's the, if you want to know where I stand on fighting trans uh, sports and, and bathroom issues, go to Alliance Defending Freedom, ADFlegal.org. They are the leading edge.
edge on fighting this. They fought for the track stars back in Connecticut. They're fighting it all over the country. I've been engaged with them in helping to fight these battles. That's why you know I'm actually going to do it, because I've already been doing it before I even ran for Attorney General. Thank you. And I frankly agree with everything that's been said, and I support the legislature. These are difficult issues, and our kids, I mean, there is a brainwashing that is going on. Their identity, who they are, is, is more and more complex, and it shouldn't be. And what we see is the legislature, fortunately, is tackling these issues, right? In 2022, they tackled the issue of sports, women's sports. In 2023, they tackled the issue of uh, gender surgeries, right? And then this year, they tackle the same thing as it relates to bathrooms. And I support them, I support their efforts because they're taking the hard stances and they need an attorney general who will back them up. Because when these laws are passed, they're challenged. HB 11, the past involving sports, we knew it was gonna be challenged and it was challenged almost immediately within a day or two after it was filed. And so when you have these laws that you know are gonna be challenged, uh, like the trigger law involving abortion. We had a trigger law that went into effect for, what, two days until it was challenged. You need an attorney general who will work with, back up, and support the laws and defend the laws that have been passed by the legislature. These gender issues are just another symptom of the disease of over, uh, or federal overreach. Title IX, when it was written, said, you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. And then the regulations tracked that. Under the Biden administration, Title IX was reinterpreted to erase sex as a determination in sports and education. And that has to stop. Under the Trump administration, we'll be able to pivot back. So I support Trump. He will be better for Utah. And in terms of dealing with this, I've litigated Title IX cases specifically on issues of gender and sports, and I'm ready to hit the ground running to deal with this one too. Uh, to follow up on that one, uh, what is your position about underage surgeries? I think it's child abuse, pure and simple. Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's completely unfair for parents to determine that kind of nonsense is going to happen to their child and the child never really gets to make that decision as an adult. This is just completely wrong. We need to fight this every step of the way. And uh, you can guarantee again that I'll fight it because I've already been in the trenches fighting these sorts of issues. Thank you. The Attorney General's office protects children. That's what you do. And there are so many areas where we protect children deliberately and proactively. We don't let them drive until they're 16. We don't let them drink. Uh, we don't let them even go into tanning beds without parental approval. But to have these kind of surgeries for minors, it, this is a serious problem. And so I absolutely support what's been said. I have a real problem with that. And I think that I support not only the legislature in their efforts to curtail this, but ultimately, we need to protect kids. It is, it is our job. And if we don't protect them, who is going to? I support the legislation that Dr. Kennedy worked on last session. Contrary to the media reports, it was thoughtful and it was compassionate and it's what's best for kids. Frank's absolutely right, it's child abuse. Okay, but here's the issue, when we talk about being proactive, that comes at the very end, right? When a child goes that far and gets a doctor to do that for them. Well, you gotta move up the chain, okay? You gotta be a little more proactive. You cannot have a governor with a bully pulpit announcing his pronouns to these children and playing them with the brainwashing that they I have two pronouns, it's attorney general. Those are my pronouns. But it goes even farther than that. Look, it goes farther than that. We talked about this earlier. You can't arrest parents who go to school board meetings because they have an opinion that goes against the school board. The parents are the ones that are trying to protect the children even before we are. How are they going to arrest them in these meetings? If you listen to the parents, we wouldn't have to be already talking about this. It would be a done deal because the parents want to protect them even more than we do. I want to protect my kids. Frank wants to protect his grandkids all along the board. 
right? So we have to go right to the root of the problem. We have to re-empower the parents in this state. And again, an attorney general has so much power litigation-wise to do that, but needs to use the bully pulpit to stand up and say what's right for our kids. Are you concerned about election integrity in Utah <laughs> and nationally? What, if anything, should be done uh, to ensure that every citizen uh, can vote and only valid uh, votes are counted? We are talking about voter ID, uh, paper ballots, etc. Thank you. I'm a little bit old-fashioned on this issue. I'll agree. I like the idea of everyone showing up on election day, having ID and voting. I know it's kind of old fashioned and I know it's really convenient to have it arrive in your mailbox. Now that is the law as it is, but I do have a serious issue with it. I spent two full years as the state party chair and there's probably no issue I dealt with more than this in terms of election security. In fact, 20 years ago, this year, I was a volunteer attorney with the Republican National Lawyers Association in Milwaukee, filing motions and stopping Democrats from filing multiple provisional ballots where the unions were literally busing people from polling place to polling place. I've seen it, like I've been on this election integrity issue for 20 years and as state party chair, I fought it. I worked with the county clerks on these issues. I will continue to do it and as attorney general, I will do a thorough review of our state statute as it relates to elections from top to bottom and work with the legislature to make sure we have the most secure election system in the country. Transparency is a root of trust, and if we don't have transparency in our elections, we don't trust them. We lose trust in our elections, we're all in trouble. Democracy is on its way out. So yes, I support, I am, obviously we're all in favor of election integrity. That's why we're here. Yes, but how do we get there? Well, we need the state to show its homework. It's not good enough for the state to say, no, everything's good, you're covered, we looked at it and you're fine. No, we're gonna make the state show its homework. You should get to audit the work that's done so that you have trust because there's transparency in the election. Yeah, I have something to say about this. Um, when I was in the private sector and I was working with those entrepreneurs, we told every single one of them, you gotta get an audit. Even if you can't, I mean, you gotta find the money to get an audit. You have to have an audit, or no one takes you seriously, right? Your investors won't take you seriously. No one will take you seriously. All we keep hearing is that our elections are safe and secure, safe and secure, safe and secure. And we don't know that that's true until we do the full audit of the electoral system and prove that it's true. So look, it isn't, and let me say this elections need to be on paper, in person, period. That's it. But it's not just enough to say that because people are going to say, well, it is convenient. And we need to have the facts to go back to them and say, I get that. It's convenient. But your vote didn't count. And here's the reasons why. Is it still convenient if your vote didn't count? We need to have that audit to show them, I get it. You think it's convenient, but they just stole your vote. Okay? And until we have that, we can't fight the battle, right? They'll just say, well, it's more convenient and people will go with that. We need to run a full audit, top to bottom. But it's not just what happens on election day. Has anybody heard of ERIC? Do you know what that is? Okay? It's a system that does not work, that we're currently subscribed to, that's supposed to clean our voter rolls, and it does the opposite. We need to fix that. It's all the system, top to bottom, that we need to look at, and it's going to be a four to eight year process. The person that's attorney general is going to have to be committed to that for their entire term. Totally agree with what's just been said. And I will say that there's been election fraud around for years. Uh, uh, Johnson, back in Texas, uh, one, of the, one of his staff members was convicted from ballot harvesting. The state of Georgia went from, went from red to blue in four years, one election cycle. And a lot of where that fraud has historically happened has been the absentee ballots. There were people on the American Center for Law and Justice who were talking about this very issue, and several people had received more than one absentee ballot. That's where we need to start going into this. Because one, I requested one a long time ago. I automatically get one every time. That's not right. You should have to request it. There should have to be a reason. You should have to document that this, this is who you are and not just have this willy-nilly, let's just mail these out. And someone, who knows who's mailing them in? So this is one of the areas that we have to scrutinize, but we need to scrutinize the whole thing. As technology increases, this risk is getting worse. And so the little amount of fraud that you had with Johnson, whether that's through anything or not, I don't know. But it's getting worse and we gotta fight it.
So here's a controversial question. Uh, <laughs> should the U.S. send another 50 or 60 billion dollars to Ukraine? Well, there is no audit or accounting uh, for the billions of dollars already sent. The deficit is increasing at the rate of a trillion dollars every hundred days, and our own border is an open door. Again, transparency is at the heart of trust. There's no transparency in the dollars that we've sent to Ukraine. While we want to support our uh, allies, we don't have the transparency, so I wouldn't send another dollar until there's proof that these have been used appropriately. And then we'll be No, I would not send another dollar to foreign aid or to Ukraine that's going to get laundered and sent back to the Democratic Party. I would not do that. <laughs> Look, it's, it's, it would be malpractice in any other industry, but to not take care of the needs of your citizens before the needs of someone else. I get it. There, there are allies in the region and whatnot, but it's not, it's not necessarily a state issue. But it is a state issue because those are our tax dollars, right? Look, there's two kinds of attorneys out there. If any of you have ever hired an attorney, you know this is true. There's two kinds of attorneys. There's one that'll say, no, that's their job. Their whole job is to say, no, you can't do that, no, okay? There are other attorneys that'll say, we're going to figure it out. This is what the law says, we're going to figure it out, we're going to get it done, okay? That's what you need as a state attorney general. One that puts your rights first and says, we're going to figure it out, right? And can have an effect on those larger issues. We won't be sending any more of our money to any of those issues until we make a big stink here. But what's happening on our federal lands? What's happening with illegal immigration? You're sending our money where? That's something an attorney general has to stand up and talk about. I agree, but two wrongs don't make a right. The fact is, is that we should defend Ukraine, but yes, how hard is this to actually make sure that it gets to the right hands? This is incompetence by this administration that they don't know that. I've given money to Ukraine to help people because I know people there, and actually my son was adopted from there. And then, you know what? And every time I've given money, it's gotten exactly where it should go. This is not rocket science. So yes, there is a problem. It needs to be fixed, and we shouldn't be throwing money away. Absolutely, I agree. But we actually should. These are, this, this is a freedom-loving country. This is a country that cares about families. Um, this is a country that is actually more conservative morally about families than, sadly, the United States is. And so this is this we do need to defend um, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, but we need to do it the right way. That we need to make sure that there isn't this nonsense of, of, of unaccountability. There has to be accountability for those dollars. Thank you. I agree with Senator Lee on this. I don't know. Do you see that he filibustered for four hours on the Senate floor on this issue? And his point was. Why is it that we're spending money trying to secure a border in Ukraine when we can't secure our own border to begin with? Lee is right, and that's what we need to do. Now, I've actually spent some time in Ukraine. I've worked in some law schools. I talked with law students and lawyers. I taught the rule of law, and there's two things I learned. Number one, Ukraine is full of phenomenally good people, human beings, and I feel like just horrible about what has happened you know, exactly two years, starting two years ago. The second thing I learned is that corruption and bribery is institutionalized. It's part of their system. Some of the wealthiest people in their country are also the government officials. There's a reason for that. So when Senator, someone like Senator Lee says, we need accountability, we need to know where that money's going. We need to make sure it goes to its intended individuals and recipients. He's right, because if we don't know where it's going, I have a pretty good idea of where it's likely to end up. So that transparency in Ukraine is critical. A final question, and then we'll have uh, each of the, give each of the candidates another minute to, to summarize their position. We are all Republicans. Donald Trump is, the, is the, now the presumptive uh, uh, nominee for the party. Do you, will you endorse him uh, for the nomination? Or if not, who would you support? I 100% fully and with no reservation support Donald J. Trump for President of the United States. Here's something you never ever heard me say, we'll all support the nominee. Okay? Because the nominee always should have been Donald Trump. Okay? That is someone saying, I don't want to commit right now. I hope it's not Donald Trump, but I'm just going to say I'm going to support the nominee, okay? I have always said I support Donald Trump. Um, 
I want to um, I want to agree with Derek on something. He said, you know, the, the, the country officials in those countries are the, some of the wealthiest people that they have. That's true in our country, too. Have you ever heard of someone that goes into Congress broke and they come out a multi-multi-millionaire? Okay. They do that for a reason, okay? Here's something else I want to say, and it goes along with my support of Donald Trump. I will say, true terms, that's it, no more, I'm done. And the reason I tell you that is because I do not want in any universe to be the governor. I don't want to be the senator, and it allows me to make decisions free of any bias or any, do I need to do a favor over here, do I need to do a favor, I'm going to upset those people. No. I'm going to represent your interests, and I'm going to do it for eight years, and then I'm done, period. I'm in favor of term limits, I'm in favor of Donald Trump. Sorry, Trent, but I agree. <laughs> exactly. I'm only running for attorney general, nothing else. Um, I absolutely support Trump. And what I say to people is, I don't necessarily like every aspect of Donald Trump. But I'm going to tell you this, that if you're a lawyer that fights appellate cases, you like Donald Trump. And it's not just because of the US, U.S. Supreme Court, which was amazing. The ADF, Lions Defending Freedom, they basically said he changed the face of the Ninth Circuit so you could actually win religious freedom cases there now. You know, so whatever anyone thinks of it, he would not have the significant religious freedom if he hadn't been in that office in 2016 to 2020 because a COVID case came up from California and it came out 6-3. The liberals were in favor in that case of government regulation over religious freedom. If it had swung the other way, it would have been 6-3 the other way against having church services in California, even though you could go to a Home Depot gas stations and do all sorts of things. So yes, I support him and I encourage other people to do because it's the right thing to do for, for a lot of reasons. Thank you. I support this job. In fact, what's interesting is when I was the state party chair, as the state party chair, you have to be neutral in terms of your candidates. And you probably have seen that with our state party chair. They have to be careful to, to have neutrality. There's one exception to that rule, and that is the state party chair doesn't have to be neutral necessarily if your candidate is running for president. And you saw me for two years, I defended President Trump. And in fact, try being the state party chair when the press calls every morning and says, hey, so about last night's tweet, we'd like you to comment. Let me tell you, I'll tell you what I like. I like that he reduced taxes. I like that he secured our border. I like that he didn't get us in new wars. I could go on and on. I like that he pulled us out of ridiculous climate accords across the world. And I'll tell you what I like most, and what matters most for the position of Attorney General. Three names. Amy Coney Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. Enough said. I endorsed Donald Trump weeks ago, and it's because our country was freer, safer, and more prosperous under Donald Trump than these last four years. So yes, I support his candidacy, and for the sake of Utah, we'll fight to make sure he wins. Okay, let's uh, give, give each candidate uh, one minute to wrap up, and uh, we'll be finished today. Thank you. You've heard me mention Lions Defending Freedom, and the reason I mention this is because it's actually work that I've done. I've done over 2,000 hours of cases free of charge for, to help people vindicate their constitutional rights. That's why you know that I'm going to do it once I get in the office. I also have pretty much all the Second Amendment um, endorsements in this state. Mitch Velos is the seminal attorney for Second Amendment in this state. He wrote the book, Utah Gun Laws. Back on my table, I have his endorsement on this. That's because he also knows I've been in the trenches. I've been fighting these cases for the last 36 years, especially when I was in private practice over the last 24 years. And that's what I ask you to look at. How do you know that each of us is really going to do what they say unless you've done it when you weren't getting paid for it? Not what you did for some other senator, not what you did in some other capacity, but what you did when you signed your case on the line and walked into court. That's what I'm talking about. That matters. Thank you. And as state party chair, I led these fights and I didn't get paid a penny. It was in fact, they sometimes call it the most thankless job in the country, in the state, because you're not getting paid a cent. And it's a full-time job. 
Let me tell you, ultimately this comes down to leadership and the ability to execute the very things that we've talked about today. This is the most critical piece of what we have to do. There's a reason Senator Lee's endorsed me in this race. It's because I worked with him side by side on the very things that we've talked about. I know how to do them. I know that the battles for the future of Utah and our country aren't necessarily going to take place in the halls of Congress. They're going to take place in courtrooms across the country. And we need an attorney general here in Utah who will stand up, who has a track record of doing that, and who knows how to do it. I'm Derek, thank you. I appreciate you all being here, thank you. I didn't sign up to do this work just because it came with a shiny new title. I've been doing this work for a decade. I know what it takes, I know how it feels, I know what it requires in terms of both legal expertise, which I have, have demonstrated over and over and over again in difficult cases, but also in leadership in knowing how to run a state agency. And I have the trust and support of the people who are carrying the heavy water, the law, law enforcement officers who are having to deal with child pornography, the public lands attorneys who are fighting to protect our public lands. They support me because they know I support them. I will work for you all day, every day, and make you proud of the work that I do, and I will ask you every day to hold me accountable. I'm Rachel Terry. I'm running for Attorney General. You can learn more about me at rachelforutah.com. When I go around the state and I make the statements that I made here today, people say, Trent, could you really do that? Because that's going to make a lot of people mad. Could you really do what you're going to do? And let me tell you what I tell them. Um, when I decided to get in this race, I went to the chairman of the board of my company. Um, his name is General Lance W. Lord. He's a retired four-star general and former commander of the U.S. Space Command. And I started giving all the reasons why I'm doing it. It's really important, and I promise. And he said, stop, Trent, stop. He said, you prepare for war, but you do, not want, you do not know when it comes. And when it comes, you fight. And when you fight, you fight to win. And when you win, then you come home. And if you're done in June, if you're done in November, if you're done in eight years, you come home, because we got you. Everybody in my company at the executive level is former military, and they know what it means to fight the fight when it comes to you, and that's what I want to do. I don't want any job after this. I want to go back to my job, but I want to fight for the individual rights of you as citizens every single day. That's what I'm about, is fighting for you. It doesn't matter if they come for me, because they've got my back, and I've got yours. Thank you very much, uh, candidates. You've given us a lot to think about today and great responses. Thank you again.